Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Boston and the opening session of the inaugural ASM Microbe. Please welcome ASM's president, Dr. Lynn Enquist. This is exciting. So welcome to ASM Microbe 2016. We've been looking forward to this moment since we announced two years ago that we would bring ICAC general meeting and ASM's general meeting under one roof. I'm really thrilled that we're finally here in Boston with over 11,000 of you to experience what I believe will be an extraordinary meeting. Now I'd like to welcome those of you who are joining us today remotely for today's session. So many of you have contributed your time, expertise, and feedback to get us here. I really want to thank you for your efforts. I'd particularly like to thank all of our program committee members for their hard work, as well as acknowledge the outstanding leadership of the meetings board chair, Dr. David Hooper. It's truly an exciting time for the microbial sciences, uh, and nothing signifies this more than this opening session. Having Bill Gates, here today underlines the importance of our work as microbiologists in solving many of the global challenges that are the focus of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Through this foundation, Bill Gates works with his wife Melinda to expand opportunity to the world's most disadvantaged people by collaborating with grantees and partners. By investing in discovery research and building a global network of created minds, Bill Gates brings people together to address the greatest global health challenges we face. To lead what I know will be a fascinating conversation with Mr. Gates today, we are fortunate to have Dr. Richard Besser, ABC News Chief Health and Medical Editor, to interview and have a conversation with, Dr. Gates, with Mr. Gates. A pediatrician by training, Dr. Besser previously spent many of his years at the CDC addressing sig significant public health issues, including acting serving as acting director during the H1N1 influenza epidemic. His background as a physician, a public health advocate, and the journalist will continue and will contribute to a rich discussion today. This is a significant moment for ASM, and it's truly an honor to be part of it. Please join me in welcoming Bill Gates to the stage, who's going to give us a few opening remarks before his discussion with Dr. Besser. Good afternoon. Uh, it's exciting to be here. Uh, I left Boston, that is, dropped out of Harvard about 40 years ago. Uh, and if you'd asked me at the time I, whether I'd return uh, to talk to microbiologists and uh, be learning about plate culture and microbiomes and all those things, I, I would have said absolutely not. Uh, that was not the direction I was going in. But a number of things. Uh, the success of Microsoft, uh, the creation of the foundation uh, together with my wife, Melinda, and us adopting global health as our biggest priority has meant that I've had a, a great opportunity to learn about health and uh, think about uh, the important work uh, that all of you do. One of the key things our foundation is uh, prioritizing is reducing childhood death. And here, uh, there's definitely good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that there's been a huge reduction. Uh, over the last 25 years, uh, we've gone from about 9% of children under 5 uh, dying uh, to now 4.3%. That is really phenomenal. That's a faster decline than ever in the history of the world, uh, but it's still almost 6 million children a year. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do. Uh, to take the latest in science and the resource of the world and, and cut that number uh, even more dramatically. In fact, the goal is very simple. Uh, it's global health equity. That is, a child in a poor country should have no more of a chance of dying uh, than a child in a rich country. And today they are uh, more than 50 times more likely to die. So still plenty to be done. 
The pie chart here is a pretty central one. Uh, it shows the causes of death for children under the age of five. And what you can see is we've got a few things uh, that are very clear, diarrhea, pneumonia, and malaria. And for each of those, uh, we have a, a pretty clear understanding. Uh, new drugs, new vaccines, getting the coverage of those things out there. Uh, there's no doubt that our goal for the next, 20, uh, fi the next 15 years, uh, which is to cut the childhood death rate in half again, uh, for those diseases, I think uh, we're absolutely on track to get there. We, we need resources, uh, some new discoveries, but we uh, have that roadmap map in mind. The biggest part of this pie, you'll see there labeled neonatal, uh, is children who die in the first 30 days of life. And almost half of that's in the first seven days, and almost half of that is in the first day. Uh, there's a variety of causes subscribed, but it's fair to say that we actually know uh, far less about that than we need to. And so unlike in the other cases where the kind of tools and things we need to do are clear, in this case, we actually need a lot more discovery to understand what the elements are and, and how we can drive that down. Our foundation invests uh, in all these diseases of uh, developing countries, including the adult, adult diseases like HIV and, and TB. Uh, we have great collaborations, uh, both with the private sector, with the universities, uh, with the government institutions. It's, it's really been great to see how uh, we can get a, a critical mass of people and rally around this cause. Uh, one of the things we did was create, all the way back uh, at the beginning in 2000, a group to buy vaccines for the poor countries called Gavi. Uh, some amazing vaccines, of course, have been invented, but ironically, those vaccines, the natural course is that they're used in rich countries for the kids who have the least chance of being exposed to the disease, and it takes over 25 years before they get out into the poorer countries uh, where the children are most at risk. Uh, but for two of the new miracle vaccines, specifically rotavirus uh, and pneumococcus, that time lag has been eliminated. And it's, it's been great to see. Uh, this chart shows the coverage, how uh, between now and 2020, we expect to get rotavirus uh, into every country and, and literally to every child on the planet. Likewise, for pneumococcal vaccine, you can see a very similar curve, actually even a little bit ahead of rotavirus introduction. And so these are the kinds of things that will be the reason uh, we can cut those deaths in half again. I want to talk just quickly about one particular uh, cause. It's the foundation program I spend the most time on, and that's uh, polio eradication. This started back in 1988. Uh, with Rotary and other partners well before we were involved, but <clears throat> starting in 2003 and then intensifying in 2007, we got very involved to make sure uh, that this eradication would succeed. And at the time, uh, we had a lot of cases in India and in Nigeria, uh, and it looked very, very tough. Uh, but in fact, the last few years have gone well, uh, zooming in these are the case numbers uh, for the last few years. Uh, now we're down to just two countries that have polio. Uh, we haven't had a case uh, for over three years in India, uh, three and a half years, and about two years in Africa. And so it's just Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the last 1% is very, very hard. You, you've got to uh, get all the kids, uh, even when there's unrest, even when uh, the Taliban, in some cases, is targeting the polio workers. Uh, so it's, there's no guarantee, but with luck, the last case of polio should be uh, sometime next year. Uh, and then we wait three years to be certified and become the second disease ever uh, to human disease to be eradicated. Uh, we do need to do a lot more in surveillance. Uh, uh, after the Ebola epidemic, a lot of people got together and said this is important. Uh, hopefully the, all the resources will be there, but our foundation is building six sites uh, in Africa, we're gonna get biopsied samples and really understand what's going on with diseases, the diseases that are already there and new things that come along. And all of the great new tools that you're inventing and working with are why that surveillance network will give us a much better understanding of, of what we need to do. So the goal is global health equity. Uh, 
you know, I hope all of you think about these infectious diseases and the work we still need to do because uh, the opportunity to make incredible progress uh, is phenomenal. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Thanks so much for those remarks. It, it's a real pleasure to, to be here at the, uh, at the ASM meeting. Um, I was telling you before, I used to come in my days when I was at, at CDC and uh, you know, found it extremely stimulating. I, I, we're here with over 7,000 scientists who are in the room who are, are working on a lot of these topics. And I have a number of questions that I want to ask you. And then uh, a number of people in the audience submitted questions. We'll take a few of those and then come back to some of, uh, some of my questions. So let's, let's go ahead and, and get started. You use the term catalytic philanthropy. What is it that you, you mean by catalytic philanthropy? Well, hopefully uh, a few dollars can have a large impact. And uh, there's a couple of ways that that can work. One is that if you can help invent a new tool, uh, a new vaccine, a new drug, then the effects can be super dramatic. And the marketplace, uh, when you have poor people with diseases, it doesn't work to create an incentive there. So government or philanthropy has to do it. The other thing that can be catalytic is if you have a, a delivery system like a primary healthcare system in a country that's not working well, that they're not training people properly or doing the supply chain right, uh, measuring their performance, going in and getting pilots, getting uh, better information there, uh, you can raise the quality of that up. And so a little bit of investment done properly uh, is catalytic, and then you get vaccine coverage and all those primary healthcare things to improve. And for us, that's often the, the limiting factor is that delivery system. I want to want to ask you a question about the the portfolio of of the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation, um, clearly the largest player when it comes to international health, as as foundations go. Um, but according to the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which which you support. Infectious diseases and childhood illnesses related to malnutrition are no longer responsible for the largest global health burden. It's now shifting in many places to chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, injuries, mental health. Is the Gates Foundation driving the global health agenda in the wrong direction by not addressing these issues? Well, what we do is we take anything that is the highest impact intervention and make sure that gets done. And so for us today, if we can't save a life uh, for around $1,000, it's not a good intervention. $1,000? $1, uh, $1,000. Where, where's that number from? Uh, if you do more measles campaigns, you're saving lives for $1,000. When you introduce the pneumococcus vaccine, you're actually saving lives uh, for less than $1,000. So. It, as we look at our different trade-offs, uh, it's, it's incredible how far dollars go. It's, it almost makes you say, hey, how come more resources aren't going into this? Because in terms of health equity, we're treating the lives in these countries as being worth less than 1% of what we treat a life in the rich country. In terms of those statistics, the years of life lost, infectious disease is still the biggest part. Now our success means that that will no longer be the case. Uh, pneumonia has gone down a lot, diarrhea has gone down a lot. Malaria we're even talking about, although it's in a 30-year uh, time frame, about making that another disease like polio that gets eradicated. Some of the things we do, like uh, HPV vaccine or uh, anti-smoking work we do, are non-infectious disease activities, but they meet this, this incredible test that the impact is very, very high. So, I, so success would mean that we get to move on. Uh, you know, think there are some heart disease interventions that are very cost effective nowadays. The chemotherapies that are today very expensive, I hope th those come down. I hope someday that can become a priority as well. So if, if the interventions are there that are proven effective at that threshold, that, that could be an area that you would move into. Or, or we'd help invent something uh, that would work at that level. Sometimes we get tiered pricing, so then you have to just look at the cost 
uh, the delivery cost, the manufacturing cost of what that tool would be. But we do partner on some things like TB, which although it's mostly prevalent in uh, the poor countries, it's everywhere. And so our partner would get the market uh, for the middle income and rich countries and we'd get a, a very low price for the developing countries in return for helping to fund the R&D. Uh, I, I want to get to some of those topics in, in a little bit. It, I, I, I want to to start with with a discussion around polio because it clearly is such a uh, a, a big focus and interest of, of the foundation. Looking at the 2015 investments, uh, $463 million for polio is the single largest outlay. Um, I want to know whether you think they, you are going to be able to knock it out of the uh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan region. But, but first I want to ask about the, the amount of money that's being spent. You know, if you, if you asked health ministers in the countries that, that you're working in, in the last countries that are being affected, polio probably wouldn't be in the top 10 in terms of their, their health concerns. Um, is it right to focus that much effort on, on polio when other diseases, pneumonia, rotavirus, are, are claiming so many more lives? In an eradication, if you succeed, uh, then you get to zero. And zero is a magic number because when you get to zero, then you're not only saving the medical costs of treating people and the lifelong effects, in this case of paralysis, but you're also saving all the intervention costs. And so the world today spends a lot, over a billion dollars a year, on polio prevention. If we get to zero, uh, which I'm optimistic, but I'm, I'm biased because I'm so close to it, uh, then you don't have to spend any of that money. So the returns are unbelievable. Probably the highest return ever in global health uh, was smallpox eradication. And the last year, yeah, they spent 100 million to get rid of like 30 cases. But then every year since then, the lack of disease and the lack of having to even think about vaccination and its whatever side effects it has, that's been a mind-blowing return. So you, eradication is not to be done lightly because per case at the end, you are spending an immense amount in order to get all those years of zero out in the future. And so if you try and fail, you hurt the credibility of the endeavor and you waste a lot of money and you misprioritize things. In the case of polio, what we have to do is take all the energy we put into it, where we're mapping the villages, where we're training healthcare workers, where we're fixing the cold chain. We have to make the legacy of polio the fact that routine immunization for things like measles and diarrhea, and, uh, that those are far better because we were there strengthening those health systems. Will the strategy that has proven very effective in Nigeria and India work in Pakistan, Afghanistan? And, and how detrimental was it, the efforts that, that uh, were undertaken that used polio vaccinators in, in, a, in a way where they weren't necessarily just vaccinating for polio? Yeah, the, uh, what's referred to there is that the, the CIA did a fake vaccination uh, campaign. In the movie, it was polio vaccine, but in, rea in real life, it wasn't, it wasn't polio vaccine because polio vaccine, we're mostly using OPV, which are drops. Uh -huh. This was hepatitis B because they wanted to get genetic material and because they would have had a syringe with some blood in it, they could have seen the genetic lineage of the children that were in that compound. But in terms of, of trust of vaccinators? It didn't help. Uh, and a lot of people who run public health schools wrote a letter to the president, and the president at least subsequently uh, said that that tactic of a fake vaccination campaign, because of its ill effects on the credibility of vaccination, uh, that, that the US would not use that again. It, it, I have to say it wasn't the key thing that's held us back there. The key thing that's held us back there is that the Taliban, for reasons that are hard to understand uh, in a rational framework, they've decided polio vaccination is a bad thing. And so they target these vaccinators. And the entire area they controlled was Ziristan, which had about 600,000 children in it. They didn't allow any vaccination in there. And so when the Pakistani army went in, our case numbers, we just weren't seeing those cases. The case numbers went up as those kids moved around the country, were, were spotted, and 
infected others. Uh, now the inaccessible kids is down to a pretty small amount, but it's their opposition that explains why those are the last two countries in the world with polio. One of the, one of the paradoxes uh, in, in public health you, you alluded to, as you get uh, closer and closer to controlling public health problem, the funding to support it tends to, to go away. And it, and it tends to come back. That's the situation with TB in the US and around the globe. Have you had difficulty maintaining the support for polio as you're getting closer? Well, yes. Uh, we were going to people and saying, OK, there's less cases, and now we need to spend twice as much money. Uh, so the, the global budget went from about 500 million a year to about a billion a year uh, for uh, starting about three years ago and through the next several years. Now, we feel good. We got a lot of governments to come on board. Uh, we, Rotary uh, goes out to its membership and, and still uh, raises funds there. But it's not an easy case to make, and there was a lot of fatigue. You know, people had said that it would be finished in India again and again and again, and it, and it wasn't. And people could go to Nigeria, and if the data that the vaccinators were reporting was correct, kids would have been vaccinated 30 times. But there was no kid that had been vaccinated 30 times. In fact, even the population numbers were wrong. That program was really, really had to be completely redesigned with lots of measurement and, and the, the satellite maps that showed us where people live were uh, an absolutely critical element of it. So yeah, uh, polio came close to not, uh, not moving forward. So, you don't want to start one of these things lightly. We are uh, starting a malaria eradication, uh, and we think you know that's a good thing. But you have to think hard before you declare that that approach. Well, that was my my next topic area. I wanted to ask you about malaria eradication, and um, it's one of the things the foundation is committed to. And one of one of the approaches. Uh, really really highlights the innovation side of, of what you do. And that's the, the use of the CRISPR technology, gene editing, to uh, combine with gene drives to possibly put through a gene that could eradicate the species of, of mosquito that is, is spreading malaria. Uh, is that essential for the eradication of, of malaria? Or, or, or could it be done with, with bed nets and, and existing technology? How important is new technology to, to accomplish this? We need new technology. Uh, and the two ones that would be the most impactful would be to have a vaccine. Uh, the vaccine we have today has a modest duration. So unless we can find some new dosing strategy, we're going to need a, a next generation vaccine. And the second is this tool, uh, which would drop the anopheline vector either modify it genetically so it can't carry the parasite, and we have some constructs that work that way, or as you said, drop the population. And what's unusual about this is that it's a genetic construct that whether the mother or the father uh, have uh, this, and then you know, the progeny carries it, and so it propagates. Uh, it's a gene drive. It's focus, a gene drive, yeah. so it propagates very effectively in, into, the, into the population. We've done a lot of modeling of that. It's not ready for prime time. There's still some scientific work going on. And then it'll be an, uh, a kind of a novel regulatory process because there hasn't been something like this in the past. But yes, I, I think particularly in the very high prevalence areas, uh, which are parts of Africa, the, it's just so difficult to stop a rebound that dropping the population numbers are going to be part of the eradication. Um, in in follow-up to that, a question that, that really relates to um, when technology is ready for use. Um, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, they released a statement cautioning that there wasn't enough evidence yet to safely re release gen uh, genetically modified mosquitoes into the wild. And the question is, who gets to decide when there's enough evidence to release something like this that, that may not be able to be reversed? Uh, well, the mosquitoes won't get to vote uh, uh, on this one. Uh, it's sovereign, in the end of the day, it's sovereign nations that decide what the trade-offs are. 
you know, we see that in terms of agricultural technology, medical technology. There is a, in large part, a people look to the United States because our regulatory structures are viewed as, as being the highest quality. Now that sometimes can mean that if you have something where the benefits to the US are very, very low, and so it thinks of the risk reward ratios as not being good enough, it, it may for some individual country uh, be something where th maybe they should think of it differently. But in most cases, people want either Europe or the United States to bless new medical technology. Uh, and so I think likely one of those uh, top regulators will, will need to weigh in on this gene drive. It's also possible that a, a country could decide on its own, but I, I don't think that's the probable case. Yeah, in, it, in that situation, given that mosquitoes don't respect borders, uh, you could have a situation where one country says, yeah, we want to give this a trial, and the bordering country says, we don't think it's, it, it's safe yet. Do we have the, the global framework in place to be able to handle some of the technologies that, that you all are, are working on? Well, we always have problems that are global in nature. Climate change is like that. You know, somebody could decide uh, to do geoengineering or not participate in CO2 reduction. Epidemics are like that. Wars are like that. And the coordination of how you get consensus on those things, it's, it is very, very uh, difficult, particularly if your lack of surveillance uh, for, say, epidemic disease puts your neighbor at risk. How do they convince you that, that you ought to do that? On this mosquito thing, I just, I don't think that many problems are going to come up. That is the pro-mosquito lobby. I don't think it's going to come up with huge reasons. Uh, you know, we ought to go through, you know, understand everything about this. But I, I my guess is that, is that uh, this tool will find use and that that will be a big reason we'll take the half million a year uh, kids who die from malaria and, and drop that dramatically. You know, here in the, in the U.S., there, there's a lot of concern about the, the Zika uh, spread through the Caribbean and, and South America. And um, one of the potential solutions there is, again, a genetically modified mosquito. I saw uh, this being applied in parts of Brazil and dramatic reductions in mosquitoes uh, that could carry dengue fever or, or Zika. Um, in Florida, where there's been approval for, for testing, the community has come out and said, no, we, we don't think that this is a way to go forward. Um, the question I have has to do somewhat with, with, with another part of your portfolio, which is education and the role of scientific literacy uh, to be able to move forward with some of the things that, that you want to do. Um, is that an area that, that I, I didn't notice scientific literacy in, in your portfolio, but I do see literacy. Yeah, no, our, our education program and our global health program, there really isn't a synergistic element where you know, we teach people about vaccines and they, you know, they're super enlightened uh, in terms of how they, they think about these things. Uh, the, you know, the general view of some of these vector interventions changes once a population is at risk. So it'll be interesting to see, like in that Florida case, as Zika's uh, actually coming in, you know, how, how people think about that. We're not involved in the oxytech sterile male, which is the one that there uh, was some initial reaction to. The thing we're involved in uh, mostly that, that uh, actually could get rolled out in some locations is a Wolbachia infection mm -hmm. of the 80s mosquito. And that causes the amount of, uh, the number of mosquitoes that carry a number of viruses, including dengue and Zika, to go down to quite dramatically. We, over the last 12 years, have done a lot of community trials, first in Australia, then in Indonesia, then in the Philippines. And actually, have had uh, because we've done a good job of community education, actually, our partners who actually are doing the work handled that very well, there was a very positive reception to that. So all of these things, you can't just jump into a community without explaining the risk rewards, being honest, taking time, letting people hear both sides of the arguments. Uh, and Zika's come across 
prana so quickly that those discussions really are just starting. The, last March, um, you were very vocal. You, you published an article in the New England Journal, uh, as well as the New York Times op-ed that was really a, it was a wake-up call to the global health community about response to epidemics and preparedness for ep epidemics. And you wrote about the importance of investing in health systems, disease surveillance, and other aspects of, of public health infrastructure. Uh, clearly, there's, there's less interest in, by donors and governments in funding in infrastructure than there is in funding efforts around a particular disease. Uh, yet infrastructure is essential for being able to detect uh, epidemics and respond to new, uh, to, to new problems. Um, when I look at the Gates Foundation portfolio, it again is very disease specific. Um, why does the foundation not invest more directly in, in lab scientists and epidemiologists and health communicators in a general fashion rather than a disease specific fashion? Well, we're the the biggest external funder for primary health care systems. Uh, and that is really at the heart of the, the quality of delivery. And you'd be surprised. There are countries, even at very low levels of wealth, who run extremely good primary health care systems. Uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Senegal. Uh, they've got a cadre of people who make sure the supply chain, the training, the staffing, that they're doing a very good job there. And that makes a huge difference in those health outcomes. And so that's the primary delivery. It's not doctors in our case. Most of the people in these countries will never meet a doctor during their entire lifetime. It's that uh, clinic that's out there in the rural areas serving people. And understanding how we can help out with that, that's increase in importance. It's been uh, the fastest growing program we have is what we call integrated delivery to help take the best practices from the countries I mentioned and try to get the other countries up, up to that level. Let me, let me just, just push, push on that a little bit. The, the clinical care is, is one side, but the public health system, the people who are going to look across your clinics and identify wow, they're seeing an increase in pneumonia across this region of the, of the country, and the, the laboratories that will then be able to look at that and, and respond to that. Um, during my time at CDC, and, and currently, it's been very hard to get government to say that's an important thing to do and an important thing to, to fund. And recently, Congress has said, take the money that was going to build those systems in Africa after Ebola and use it on, on Zika. Yeah, the, the question of should an outside country help fund that sort of CDC equivalent in these African countries is very interesting. And the U.S. has been not as generous as I, either you or I would like, but we have been the most generous of any country. And the global health security agenda, uh, the money that was uh, budgeted after Ebola was going to actually pick a number of African countries and have CDC go in and do a, a very important job there, which they do a, an absolutely fantastic job of that. As you said, that money uh, may be diverted. It's still kind of confusing right yeah. now that money might come back. Uh, that is a, it's a mistake not to fund those things. We tend to specialize in the primary health care clinic, which is what, what we know. We do less on the, um, uh, the, the public health system broadly. One concept that we have been working with the CDC on uh, is that we saw during the Ebola outbreak the most effective response was taking polio people who understood public communication and emergency operation centers and case tracking. Because polio interrupting it for three or four months wasn't a problem, we could take that capacity. And in fact, Nigeria, it was, it was the polio people there who took the six cases and made sure it wasn't 6,000 or 600,000. That would have been absolutely horrific. So this time as we do malaria, we're going to train the people who are involved in these malaria eradication efforts to be available for there's an outbreak. So we're going to formalize this notion that they're the ones who are actually practice this thing. They're not somebody sitting somewhere who hasn't 
actually done it, and they will be able to move to wherever in the world uh, there, there is a problem. It's been hard to get the capacity. People's willingness to fund armies that kind of sit around waiting for wars, they, because there's been so many wars, that's a paradigm that's well understood, it's, they're willing to fund that, but then when it comes to the epidemic, which actually in terms of killing a lot of people, I would rate, I think most people would as a greater risk, they haven't been as generous on that. So we need to, we need to educate people and get more global capacity and local capacity. I, I want to ask a little bit about shared responsibility and, and the role of, of, of foundations. Uh, Gates Foundation is the largest foundation working on global health. And do you have any concerns that the size of your footprint globally is letting governments off the hook in terms of their responsibility? Well, certainly if, if I was seeing a country, uh, rich, middle income or low income, that was spending less on these issues, you know, that uh, would be a very bad sign, particularly if it was because we were there. Fortunately, there is more money going into these things. And understand, our, although our money by foundation standards is very large, you know, we're five billion a year, the total overseas aid uh, is 130 billion a year. The US government has one program, the AIDS Relief Program, which is a miraculous, wonderful program that's six billion a year. That is, that program alone is bigger than everything the foundation does in the US and, and overseas. So we are a visible uh, player in this in that we can praise the stuff that governments are doing. We can spend our money in a little bit more flexible way than other, other people can. But you know, compared to say the NIH budget, the pharma R&D budgets, these aid budgets, we're not a, a very big thing. But we, we feel like we've been a catalytic factor that more money is going into this from the rich countries, more from other philanthropists. Global health in general, uh, since 2000, has seen a gigantic increase, including the Global Alliance for Vaccines, the Global Fund. Uh, now, we're worried that, that maybe that's going to plateau, but, but since 2000, the global health story is, is a pretty amazing story, including getting more resources. You know, I have a question about, about global institutions, in particular the, the World Health Organization. Uh, following the Ebola crisis, uh, there was widespread consensus that the WHO had, had failed. They had not responded in appropriate fashion. And I wanted to get your perspective. Is that as an organization, as an institution, obsolete? Do we need a different kind of global institution? And, if we do, would it look like the WHO, but better funded? Well, it's pretty stunning that even the modest things that all these post Ebola panels have agreed on in terms of better staffing and uh, uh, an emergency fund, things like that, even those things, people aren't coming forward for the money for WHO. There's a whole ton of stuff WHO just isn't funded to do. WHO has no doctors, they have no planes, they, they have no innate capacity to go out and do things. When the Ebola crisis got very bad and it looked like the airlines might no longer fly into those countries because they were worried about their employees getting infected, it actually took a commitment by the US military to go in. Now fortunately, the airlines didn't stop there. Turned out the nature of the disease was such that most people were bedridden by the time they were infectious. But we do have this huge huge gap between what people think the WHO is funded to do and what they're funded to do. Now, even part of what they're funded to do, they did an imperfect job. And they, uh, I'll give the, the Director General a lot of credit for being willing to say, hey, the WHO could have done better. She could have chosen to ascribe that to some of her uh, sub-offices. She didn't choose to do that. She took the blame for the organization as the whole and has participated in a discussion of how to do those things better. But there's a lot that is unfunded that neither WHO or domestic governments are funded to do. The US at least has BARDA uh, that's there to think about these things. There is no BARDA equivalent in any other government in the world. Uh, that, that leads to my, my next question. I'm gonna ask one more question and then uh, go to the questions we have in the audience that people submitted ahead of time and then come back to some, some more questions. Um, I could ask questions for hours. Uh, uh, 
So this question, I, w I was recently at the Skull World Forum meeting in, in England, and someone in the audience said that the first approach to tackling global health problems should always be a free market solution. Um, however, many of the diseases that impact parts of the world, uh, they're in places where, where markets fail, where no pharmaceutical company that is truly uh, looking at their bottom line and fiduciary responsibility would develop a new, a new drug. Um, how has the Gates Foundation uh, uh, approached that problem? Well, many of the diseases we work on are present in the rich world, which you could say that's unfortunate or fortunate. Uh, HIV is, is paradigmatic. So the drug companies have done a phenomenal job creating new HIV drugs. You know, the antiretroviral field before that had very few great products. And now the discovery rate, different than the overall discovery rate, the discovery rate of new HIV medicines has been really strong. And a very extreme form of tiered pricing where they're able to pay for their R&D based on the US and other rich countries buying those medicines and then making them available literally at cost uh, and letting the generic manufacturers, including those in India, make them as cheap as they possibly can, that's been a, a perfect model. And so pharma's been incented to do their brilliant work and the availability in poor countries of those drugs has been uh, really great. In fact, the greatest cost now is not the drugs. Uh, that's down to uh, like 50 cents a day. It's actually the personnel costs. And so we're very involved in trying to get those numbers down. TB, thank goodness uh, it's still in the rich world so that people can invent new drugs and use this tiered uh, pricing approach. The place where you don't get that is in the so-called neglected diseases and malaria, where because prophylactic drugs can solve the problem, the rich, rich countries really don't care about it. And that's where philanthropy or government aid absolutely are the only way to get the R&D spending. Can you, can you say a little something about epidemic meningitis in Africa? Yeah, that was a, a pretty exciting thing where there had been expensive vaccines. You know, ironically, vaccines are often used uh, where the, the risk is lowest, but we had great meningitis vaccines. They were too expensive to be used in the so-called meningitis belt in Africa, which just had meningitis A. And so we worked with the manufacturer, uh, in this case was serum in India. We worked with the regulator, it was actually the Canadian regulator, and got a 35 cent vaccine approved. And that's cheap enough that we've been able to go throughout the meningitis belt and get people of all ages who showed up for this vaccine in droves as soon as they heard it was available because the kind of panic you get when the, the waves of disease would come through were pretty huge, so people knew about the disease. And so now we're almost done now treating all the uh, people in that area and infants, uh, it's now approved, they, they will get it. And so the number of cases uh, has been near zero in an area where from year, some years it was, was very, very dramatic. So it's a great example of- For 30 cents a dose. Yeah, for 30 cents a dose, which is uh, funded by, by Gavi for the countries that can't even, even fund that. Uh, if we have the microphone, let's go to Debbie Goff in the audience who has a question for Bill Gates. Hello. Um, my question is, from your perspective, as the wealthy United States is not winning the battle against superbugs, what do you think should be next in the global armamentarium to fight superbugs? Well, evolution is very clever. It created us. Uh, and in the case of, of microbes, the life cycles are, are pretty short and you have horizontal transfer. So in a way, it's not surprising that this is something where it's a constant battle that you have to go after. Like for most diseases, the number of people who die of antimicrobial resistance is 100 times larger in the poor countries than it is in the United States. Uh, you know, I'm, it's sad that it's in the United States, but because it's in the United States, lots of for-profit incentive is there to replenish the pipeline for antibiotics. And 
the latest science in terms of how do you culture bacteria, how do you look at the DNA of bacteria and see, even if you don't know how to turn on the expression of the antibiotic, if you can just look at the DNA, you can find it there, and that can give you a, a sense of new leads uh, for antibiotics. So the candidates that can become available, uh, science will be able to come up with a lot of those. In the U.S., there'll be strong incentives, i.e. high pricing. I, I want to I push back on that. Okay. It's, it's been more than 20 years since there's been a new class of antibiotics, and you know, the, with all the mergers of pharmaceutical companies, there's less R&D that's, that's taking place. And as a public health community, what we're asking these companies is we want you to make a new antibiotic, and we don't want anyone to use it because as soon as they start using it, we're going to see resistance rise. And so you have that market failure again where their R&D is going for d drugs for diabetes and hypertension and sexual dysfunction, and no one is making drugs for superbugs. The, you've got to make sure that the price and opportunity for them of a drug that's only going to be used in very small volume, that it's very good. And we have mechanisms. The orphan drug legislation, you can argue, should have been, have been slightly more generous or slightly less generous. But that's another bright spot in an otherwise fairly bleak picture in terms of uh, new discoveries per year. The orphan diseases, because the appropriate reward system was put in place, there's lots of good things that have gone on there. And so it is true for future drugs where you're going to restrict usage, and, the, and we need to do that for several of them, you need to make sure that there's a special incentive that makes clear for people that either they'll get a minimum amount of usage or some other way they'll see value. But I'm saying that the scientific opportunity to create new antibiotics is there. That is, evolution created a lot more chemicals than we've than we've discovered, like thousands of times more than, than we've discovered. And so it's a, a business model problem. And there's a lot of good discussion about this. Uh, there's reasons why trials have been hard to do. Again, uh, you know, the healthy versus non-healthy, the, the trial regimes are a little difficult. And the, the pr people have not felt like if they price an antibiotic high that they would be sure that they'd get some reward for that. So that's, you know, the Anil report and other things are, are talking about this. I think the rich world antibiotic thing, there are solutions coming. It's not going to be some uh, out of control problem. Will it be a new drug or a new approach to killing microbes? Well, there are various, it, mostly I think it'll be a new drug because that the system is set up. There, there are things like bacteriophage approaches that because the drugs were so cheap, that the Russians and others had played around with that may now come back to the fore uh, because the, there's an unmet need. All right, let's turn to uh, our next question from the audience. Kenny Anemo. Sir, as a philanthropist investing in countless research programs all around the world, what efforts has your foundation made in facilitating the absorption of young and upcoming scientists into the various research institutes and establishments in which you sponsor in scientific research. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, there's a huge challenge, which is that most of the spending we do to create a new vaccine or a drug is actually spent uh, on the trials, and most of that is spent in the affected countries. And so getting the capacity of the scientists in I'll just say in Africa, although a lot of this work is in Asia as well, helping this new generation of scientists come along uh, has been a key part of that. We do that in our agriculture work uh, to encourage new young scientists. We do it in our uh, family health work. And, and we do it in the scientific realm where we, we need to have institutions in Africa that are very good whether it's doing the work independently or simply being a partner for the trials, that's been very important. And uh, South Africa is where we've uh, seen the greatest capacity. Uh, the rest of the continent, there's, there is this huge vacuum, and the only thing that'll fill that in is getting the young scientists uh, those opportunities. Getting young scientists that co often come to the U.S. and then 
making sure there's an opportunity for them that it's attractive for them to go back to Africa. That, uh, there's often a, a fair bit of attrition there, but, but we're working on that. Great. Uh, Kristen Beck. So my question is, how can we better update regulators to expedite adoption of transformative microbiome methods that improve human health? So how, yeah, how impaired are we by the current regulatory systems? Well, there's certainly times we sit and say, wow, we have this miracle new thing, and how come it's taking so long, and how come our trial's so big? Overall, I'd say the regulatory system is pretty, is pretty good. Now, it's needed to make special accommodation. For HIV, it did make special accommodation to get those drugs out because there was a, a, a huge crisis there. In terms of the microbiome, you know, maybe there's something that uh, I'm not aware of that we need to change there, but so far, the work has really been at the research level to understand, in our case, undernutrition and for other cases, overnutrition. And uh, one of the approaches, uh, a company that I met with last week, is actually taking an engineered E. coli bacteria and, and you eat that as a probiotic uh, the one they're starting out with doesn't colonize, it just passes through your stomach, so you have to uh, redose yourself every few days. But it, it could, if you have certain metabolic diseases, uh, do that metabolism in these modified E. coli. In our case, for undernutrition, it's generating certain things like uh, butyrate that are viewed as, as beneficial to the development of, of the microbiome. And, you know, it looks to me like the regulatory approach is going to be reasonable. They're going to ask the right questions and that, you know, over the, the next four or five years, some of those tools will get, get out there. We're currently in, in the, the midst of the big political season. Uh, primaries are, are over and the general election is, is coming. And during the primary season, uh, I don't think a single candidate mentioned anything having to do with, with global health. Um, and as, as people now look towards priorities, uh, priorities for our country, how do you make the case to Americans that investing in global health is a good thing to do when there are so many health problems here in the United States? Well, I'd say the history on this uh, for the last 16 years is very positive. That is, both the Bush administration, Obama administration, uh, made huge commitments to global health programs. In the case of the Bush administration, the very creation of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, and the president's malaria initiative came in that administration. Uh, I was at an HIV conference and I you know, mentioned President Bush and I, I didn't, you know, I said he's done great work and I got kind of a negative response. I, I was a little su surprised about that. Uh, because really, he, his personal leadership was fairly key in getting something dramatic done there, although I will say it's been totally bipartisan since then. Likewise, President Obama has spoken out on these issues. He's gotten some additional funds, although not many budget categories have gone up. We got, did get an increase in terms of the polio funding uh, that this administration helped us. We had to go up on the hill with Rotary and make the case. And it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it, it allowed us to go to the other donors and show that the U.S. was, was doing its part. And so the U.S. has been a responsible uh, player in global health. The way it directs its R&D, the way it directs its foreign aid, the way it takes CDC expertise. You know, the number of people from CDC who went out and spent their time in the Ebola-affected countries, it's an amazing story that you know, they don't expect, uh, uh, you know, that credit because it's what they do. Uh, but, you know, what an amazing organization. And believe me, there is n the next best equivalent to CDC is not, not even close in terms of that, that depth of capability and ability to go out and, and help on a global basis. So I'm hopeful that, that uh, we'll retain this positive record that we've had you know, some candidates haven't shown a full understanding of vaccines and, and the benefits they provide. Uh, and some, you know, haven't shown an embrace of the world at large uh, in a way that might be beneficial. But we have to hope uh, that the great tradition that the U.S. should be proud of of the last 16 years, that that continues. All right. Well, I want to shift gears and, and ask you some, some questions about the foundation. Uh, 
so in the room here, there's 7,000 plus scientists from around the world. They come from a very different culture than, than Microsoft. Um, you've spent many years now working in, in the foundation. And can you talk a, a little bit about the difference between the cultures? Uh, is it the same model that you're applying to the foundation that you applied to Microsoft? And, or, or have you had to, to shift, shift your, your way of, of, of doing business? Well, there are some things that are absolutely identical. Uh, you want people who are very analytical, very engaged, uh, very open-minded, want to learn new things, who embrace science, uh, who understand that science is a 10 to 15 year endeavor and you have to pursue multiple approaches. There are some things that are different. The bottom line at Microsoft was the volume of software we sold and the profitability that generated. The bottom line for the foundation is the under five mortality rate, the nutrition, the eradication of diseases, uh, access to reproductive health tools. And so our, our metrics are different. And the skill sets, they overlap. The analytical skills are the same, but the foundation has to be far better at working in uh, poor countries, uh, countries where the government often has very limited capacity. You know, understanding how you avoid any misuse of the funds in your programs. We have to be better at working with governments in, in the rich world, making sure that their aid money is, is complementary to what we're doing, making sure that the R&D funding gets there. And so it's interesting, I'm, I'm spending a lot more time with governments in this role, the foundation role, than I ever did in, in the Microsoft role. And I'm really pleased, the willingness to talk and collaborate with the foundation is really quite incredible. So the mix of skills, scientists, people who've worked in the field. We, the difficulty of delivering these products means that you've got to have people who've seen uh, field delivery weigh in on that target product profile. So there's maybe six or seven deep types of skills that have to come together for us to have the, the impact we want to have. Which has been more rewarding? Starting and, and running Microsoft or starting and, and running the Gates Foundation? Well, I think if I tried to do this foundation work in my 20s and 30s, uh, I would have found it incredibly frustrating. You know, in my 20s and 30s, I wrote the code. I stayed in all night, I wrote the code, I didn't go home until it worked. Uh, once I'd written the code, I could ship it, I didn't have to call the FDA. Uh, and, you know, people could tell me if it was wrong, I could update my code. You know, just that kind of hands-on engineering, quick cycle, you know, the creation of the personal computer, the software industry, you know, I was just all in, just fanatically focused on that one thing. Now I'm older, you know, I can fund a lot of programs, you know, so I'm not calling a group on, say, the HIV group, you know, I don't call them on Monday and say, how's your vaccine work going, and then call them on Tuesday and say, well, have you made any progress? You know, we have enough stop that I only say that to them once every couple of months uh, and say, hey, have you done two months of, of progress in the last, uh, the last two months? So the kind of patience required, these kind of complex relationships, I think I find those more rewarding. I'm better at those things at this age. So the Microsoft stuff was perfect for my young career and the foundation stuff is, is perfect for, for this, this phase of my life. What do you see, look, looking forward, what do you see as the biggest global health challenges that, that people here will be facing, that people around the world will be, will, will be facing? Well, absent a epidemic uh, that would come and surprise us, whether it's flu or some other thing, and the big threat there is some human-to-human -human respiratory transmitted thing, uh, which could either be naturally emerging or intentionally uh, created. Put that aside, if I had one wand to solve a medical problem, it would be to solve nutrition. The impact in these countries, particularly in Africa, of kids who don't grow up and develop physically and mentally is really unbelievable. That's a greater imposition on Africa and it, its ability to uh, develop and, and support itself than any other thing. Now, right after that, you'd have you know, HIV, malaria, and TB. 
And I'm hopeful that those four wishes, all of those in, in the next 20 years, we will have uh, tools to solve nutrition and vaccines or other approaches that can solve those diseases. So, you know, I'm hopeful that the foundation will see the end of most of the problems that, that we've made a priority. Well, as, a, as a closing question, you have a, a captive audience here of some of the world's leading scientists when it comes to infectious diseases. What would you like to leave them with tonight? Well, there's, there's such a need to solve these mysteries. You know, the mysteries of nutrition are really unbelievable, whether it's undernutrition or overnutrition. The need to diagnose things, like to see microbial resistance ideally at the point of care to, you know, even understanding does a patient have a bacterial or a viral disease? You know, in Africa, if you come in with a fever, you're given malarial drugs. Well, it's possible that you need antibiotics uh, or some other intervention, and yet we're masking by not being able to tell what's going on. So the opportunity to understand the microbiome, uh, the, under, the opportunity to have really deep diagnosis, you know, the kind of skills represented here uh, and the innovation in these areas will be absolutely critical to our achieving our goals. Well, uh, it's been a delight speaking with you. On, on behalf of ASM, I want to thank you for, for coming and, and opening uh, the meeting. Uh, Great. Thank you. And that, conclu that concludes the opening session, and you are all invited to go uh, across the street to the opening reception. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, that was fun. If you are attending the opening reception, please exit the session and proceed to the front of the building towards the registration area. Exit the center on the registration level and cross the street to the World Trade Center. Look for staff holding signs with the ASM microbe logo for directions to the reception. Finally, I can see you.